thank you, Dahlia, for joining us today. Um, Dahlia is a senior associate in the CMS Energy Projects and Construction Group and has a particular focus on clean energy projects and regulatory matters um, and has been advising on CCUS projects over the last 10 years and was a member of the C CCUS Cost Reduction Tax Task Force, which recommended a new regulatory structure for CCUS back in June 2018. So it's a pleasure to have you, Dahlia. I'll hand over to you. Great. Thanks, Karis. I'm going to try and share my screen. And if that doesn't work, um, then Karis, I'm going to have to ask you for your help. So can everybody see this? Yeah, yep. that's great. Um, <laughs> OK, so um, thank you very much for um, inviting me to be part of this spring series. It would have been really nice to do this in person, but um, we're now doing social distance ways, as our new normal is. So for the next 20 minutes or so, um, I think we've got about 20 minutes of me talking and then with some luck, we can have a, a conversation where there are some questions and, and some general thoughts that are shared. So what I thought we would do is just um, step back and look at where CCS is globally and nationally in the UK. Um, then look at kind of what, where does CCUS fit in, in terms of its various, various elements. And then look a little bit closer as the what the legislative framework looks like for CCUS in the UK. Being an English lawyer, um, I figured you'd be more interested in learning what I know on the English or European regulatory side rather than um, giving you a general sweep of policy and legislature worldwide. I thought we'd do two examples, the first one being the risk allocation on a full chain CCUS project, something that many of you will recognize was the plan with government as part of demo two, and then what we learned from doing it that way. And then since then, how the business models have developed over the last five years, and now looking at what the risk allocation would look like for a split chain CCS project, which is basically what's been proposed by government in the last consultation. And then we can happily move on to some, some discussion. So if that sounds okay to everyone, um, I'll go on to basically just introduce myself and CMS just at a, at a glance. So for those of you who don't know CMS, it's a top 10 global law firm with um, in sort of 70 plus cities and 40 to 45 countries. Um, there is about 5,000 people who work at CMS in a number of jurisdictions and about 450 of those work in the energy space. Um, me, which is the picture in the middle, is, uh, as Karis has said, I'm a senior associate in the energy team, and I focus quite a lot on clean energy, energy transition, and for my sense, I've done carbon capture and storage for a number of years. Um, just to uh, be clear, these views are mine, not CMS's. CMS obviously acts for a number of players um, across the energy space, and so um, anything that I say here is, is just just my own personal view and um, there's nothing confidential that I hope I hope ever slips out in what I say. Uh, so with that, where are we on CCS projects at the moment? If you look at this map, um, there's a clear sort of co conglomeration of projects in North America and we know 70% of the current either operational and construction projects are in, in North America. But then if you look around, there is actually quite a lot happening in Europe and quite a lot has been happening or trying to happen in the UK for many years. We're also seeing a lot more development out in China, Australia and the Middle East. So I think um, wh whether you think of carbon capture and storage in the sort of traditional sense where it was done largely for enhanced oil recovery, um, the newer projects are being driven by, by other incentives, notably the tax credit 45Q in the US. And a lot of the legislation that it comes at least in Europe is all harmonized and is the energy storage directive, which we will, uh, the, sorry, the CO2 storage directive, which we will talk about in a little bit. Um, so the numbers are growing. Um, uh, there are now apparently 51 CCS facilities globally, 19 in operation, four under construction, and 28 in various stages of development. Um, but as you can see from the slide at the bottom, 
we've got a long way to go if we're going to go to getting to 2000 facilities by 2040 um, we we need to really ramp up and sort of looking looking through what's driving or what's or stopping CCS projects um, the sort of things that we keep hearing about is the regulation and the policy to drive commercial deployment so it's just that policy drivers are imperative in most countries the US, for example, has the first mover advantage because it had a sustained government commitment and now has a policy, has the 45Q policy, which means that there is a revenue attached to the carbon dioxide itself. Um, a barrier, though, is the cross-chain risks, which many of us have dealt with for many years. It's, as we'll talk later, it's it involves the coming together of a number of industries when we talk about carbon capture and storage. Um, you need the capture plant, you need the pipelines, you need the storage operators all to work together. And this means that if one part of the chain doesn't work or one part of the chain doesn't have the policy intensives or the legislation in place, then the other parts of the chain are effectively stuck. And as part of that also, if you're gonna be building such a large project, and there's any kind of state funding behind it, you're also very conscious about building a stranded asset. And so what happens uh, with the gaps is what's been holding up quite a lot of CCS projects from developing um, both in the UK and worldwide. Um, but as we know, once you get started, it then means that it's a lot easier to get going. And that's why um, what has been happening in the US is so exciting and what is happening in China also has a lot of potential. With some luck, that will also be the case for the UK in the coming years. The next bit hopefully will work. Um, Keris, will you please help me try and run this poll? Which I'd just like to get a sense from those of you uh, here. In your view, what are the most significant barriers to commercial scale CCS projects developing in the UK? Are they technological? Are they legal? Are they commercial? Are they something entirely different? Just trying to get it to work now for you. I can't see this screen. Can I, can I sort of ask a question? And I don't know if Dali will touch on this or whatever, but I'm just wondering how much of this result is biased by the fact that probably a lot of us don't know what, what the legal challenges are and therefore throw it all at commercial. That's okay. I think I think that's that's a fair that's a fair question, and hopefully um, that's where I can help a little bit of showing where the where the legals are. There's a lot of overlap, to be fair, between legal and commercial, because um, if the legal policy has gaps, we will quite often um, deal with that by through commercial means. I will price it. Can I just say I'm 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 a lawyer, as you know, to, uh, no. and actually I didn't put legal. I put down other, by which I meant particularly in Europe, and I think the UK, the kind of political support, by which I mean political and public opinion and all of that, wh whether they really understand where CCS fits in. And I think that's just been incredibly important in both the UK and Europe. So- I, Richard, I'm really glad you said lot. that. Yeah, could I- I'm really glad that. you said that. Yeah, could yeah. I second that? I think that's really the most important thing there political will. If uh, Trump and Bojo and ScoMo and others said do something, it would be done very quickly. It's interesting because I did wonder if somebody would flag that. And actually on my notes, I had written down how much of this is about the political will and, and, and public will as well about stakeholder. Sorry, and Karis, the, the, I can't the, see the book. Can someone read out to me the results? Uh, yeah, technological 0%, legal 12%. Commercial 56 and other 22. Perfect. Yeah, so I, I, think, I think we are broadly there in terms of it, uh, the issue is ab around the, so the legal and commercial. I think both of them are, are you know, uh, quite, uh, quite to blame here in terms of why they're the holdups. So, and, and yeah, I completely agree. One of the things that I think the other catches on is we still have a very reluctant public. It requires, all of decarbonization requires 
a large change in our lifestyles and the inertia and the sort of the lack of willingness to make some of those hard choices is both personal and political. So let's have a look at how committed we are to having some kind of frameworks um, for, Sorry, did, for CCS. Oh. Sorry, did the publish on people, anyone else's screen just out of interest? Or yeah. Yes. yes, yes. So okay. it did publish for everyone except for... Yeah, yeah. you can get it under polls, I, I think, um, next to is one of the options at the bottom. Yeah, it's not letting me access it on my side at all, um, which is... Yeah, nor me. Um, but it might be because I'm logged in through the web browser. I wonder if there's a, there's mm. a question mark there. But it's okay. We got the answers. So thank yeah. you for voting. Thank you. Um, so looking at where we are on the kind of global and national commitments to climate, to, to carbon capture and storage. Um, we all know about the Paris Climate Change Agreement and it's, it's the global commitment. And we know that international law is much softer, uh, quite necessarily, than the sort of the hard statutes that we have in national legislation. That said, what Paris Agreement did on a global scale has allowed a lot of the national legislation to then follow through. And notably for the UK, which is the legal issues that we'll focus on, there is a net zero commitment as of June 2019. There are caveats to it, and I'm sure all the lawyers who have read the change from 80 to 100 percent in the law also notice that there are some things that are not included and there is an ability for the government to maybe change its mind, which some would say is only fair. That said, there is a definitely a commitment um, to, uh, to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions and this meets what the Committee on Climate Change has recommended. And in doing so, what the government in the UK has done, it's also amplified the attention that carbon capture and storage is getting in the UK in terms of the policy. There's even talk of 800 million pounds in the budget for CCS projects. So it's, it's, it's changed from where we were a couple of years ago. Um, next slide, oh, not there. We don't wanna go there, sorry. Um, but I think one of the issues why we have both a, a legal issue and a commercial issue is that when people talk about carbon capture use and storage, and use has only really crept in fairly recently, we're talking about quite a jigsaw puzzle of uh, various industries. So if we just look at this excellent slide that the Scottish CCS industry produced, um, the thing that most people think about when they talk about carbon capture and storage is they talk about the capture, which is in the center here. I don't know if you can see my screen, uh, the mouse moving. They think about the pipelines and then the storage or use for EOR. So it's this sort of core bit here in the center that most people consider when they talk about carbon capture and storage. We now need to also think about the utilization part, which is on the left hand bottom which is about how do we decarbonize and what, how does carbon capture and storage play a part in the industrial biotech sector, in the food sector, in the mineralization, as well as what does it do for the wider energy system and heating. So that's the top right hand side. Um, how does it interplay with renewables, with zero carbon heat, and then further along with transport. And this is where um, hydrogen quite quite often now comes into the conversation. Um, and most importantly, I think we should also notice that CO2 little ship, there is, there is an opportunity to ship CO2, but at the moment, we don't really have a legal way of doing that. That's very clear. So if you, if you think about wanting to capture carbon dioxide, we need to think about where are we capturing it from? Is it just from a power plant, which is sort of the traditional way of looking at it? Or is it from an industrial process like cement or steel making? Was it from something else? 
And then when it's talking about transportation, there's both onshore and offshore, and the rules for those two are different. And the regulators for those two are also different. And then when we think about storage, what kind of store? Is it just one store, multiple stores? Can we ship? And then use, what kind of use? What does it need? Because each one of these is effectively a different industry, we are looking at a patchwork of legal rules that someone who's trying to develop a carbon capture and storage project needs to fit into, which, as you can imagine, just adds to the difficulty. You're trying to, in some ways, create two or three different jigsaw puzzles that will give you a final picture, but your jigsaw puzzles aren't perfectly matched. That said, the UK has got some of the most developed CCS legislation in the world. And if we kind of look at each one of these in turn, I think we shouldn't forget how advanced UK is in some ways. So let's, let's start with permitting at the top. Um, so in England and Wales, the process to demonstrate CCS readiness um, comes from the CCS directive. So in order to be able to uh, develop a carbon capture and storage project, you need to get a development consent under the Electricity Act 1989. Uh, getting a development consent order is quite an involved process. I mean, just the sort of consultation and public engagement is quite an involved stage. But ultimately, what the DCO is quite good at is it comes back to the Secretary of State for the relevant sector. So the permits are granted by BASE, which means that there is some joined up thinking when it comes to permitting of the various elements of the CCS project. Now, it's also a requirement that before um, a plant is able to be permitted, and at the moment, let's look at just the capture plant as opposed to the pipelines. They also need to do some assessments about whether it's technically feasible to capture the carbon, transport it, whether it's economically feasible to do so. And then separately, if it's a power plant related capture plant, there's also needs to be a generation consent. So that's again, Electricity Act 1989, says that you cannot do certain activities, including generation of electricity without getting a permit and a, a license. So you need to get a generation license for this. Again, that comes from base. So at least, at least on that end, Things are joined up, things are fairly coherent and all revert to base. Um, on the storage, which is probably the other element that is quite well developed in the UK, the main law for this is the European um, Carbon Storage Directive, the CCS Directive, which the UK implemented in a number of places. Um, one of which we just talked about through the permitting regime. The other one is through the Environmental Permitting Regulations 2016. Um, and then there is the Energy Act 2011 and the permitting of storage sites, which is under the Energy Act 2008 and the accompanying storage of CO2 licensing regulations 2010. So we have a very coherent framework of what you need in order to get a storage site set up. Um, what it also does, though, is that it creates a very stringent regime. Our storage uh, laws come from an oil and gas kind of mindset added to it with the CCS directive. And the license for the storage of CO2, where you do it for permanent, permanent storage, is one that really needs you to look at whether there is any kind of leakage and whether the site is capable of actually storing CO2 on a permanent basis. So the OGA, which is the licensing authority for offshore storage um, in England and Wales, needs to really consider whether the site that you have chosen is going to be safe and is going to permanently be able to have the CO2 stored in the ground for a long period of time. Where that comes up is in two places. First, you need to have an exploration license in order to even start digging an appraisal well. Um, effectively, just to collect data to see whether the site is worth doing. But before you get a, an appraisal well license, you need to prove a certain amount of technical readiness 
which the project might not necessarily have. It's easier with sort of um, new sites than it is with a depleted oil and gas sites, which may have uh, additional liabilities. So that's, that's the sort of first issue that we come up. And then the second one is the storage permit. So storage permit is something that you need in order to store the CO2. Um, otherwise, it's an, it's an offense. So a storage permit application can't be made until the exploration of the appraisal well has completed, which, which makes sense. You first find out whether it's worth doing, and then you decide whether or not to store it. The issue with the storage permit comes from the CCS directive, in that what it says is after you have stored, you need to make sure you monitor the storage site and keep updated with the kind of technological advances. So as part of the application, there needs to be a post-closure plan, which becomes part of the permit consent. And the Secretary of State must approve the proposed plan and any kind of modifications to it. What it also requires is financial security, which is form of cash, charge over a bank account, a bond or a guarantee, or insurance which begs the question of, will there be insurance for something like this? And the insurance market hasn't necessarily responded in a way that ideally we might have wanted to, partly because it hasn't really had to engage on it in, in the level of granularity yet. And the trouble with financial securities, it must be enforced before, before you commence injection and remain in place after the license is terminated. So the reason why I'm telling you about all of this is because it adds cost and complexity onto a back end of a project. So when you're, when you're looking at the capture and transportation side so that you can then store the CO2 in a storage site, you need to consider that the storage operator has got all of these liabilities and obligations under the storage permit and must be able to meet its financial security as you start a project. Um, the alternative to reduce this risk is obviously to ship the CO2. Don't store it. Don't store it in the, in the North Sea, ship it somewhere else. Or if there is a problem with the existing storage site, ship it somewhere else so it goes to another site. Um, and there we have, we have an issue with the London Protocol, which would normally uh, prohibit the export across boundaries of CO2. Um, and the UK is one of five countries that has ratified an amendment Article 6 Amendment to the London Protocol, which would allow that export. The main idea being that the North Sea is a perfect basin where you can and would want to ship CO2 so that it's possible to reduce the sort of liability risk if your particular storage site is down. So that's where we are on store, and that's, that's fairly well developed. The permitting and the store are, are fairly well developed for UK legislation. Um, health and safety is another issue where we sometimes have um, issues. Um, the UK health and safety regime is amazing. It's one of the sort of most comprehensive and well-liked in the world. Well, well maybe well-liked is a, is a strong term, but it's definitely one that is well understood and um, is a robust regime. Um, unfortunately, CO2 is, is hazardous in, in some respects, and therefore the health and safety regime and the offshore regime must be followed for CO2, uh, CO2 related projects. Again, this is, this is quite normal for the industry, especially the offshore North Sea industry, but it is something to, to bear in mind when thinking about carbon capture and storage projects. Pipelines, pipelines are probably the easiest part of a carbon capture and storage project in that um, laying pipelines on the sea has been something that um, has been done for many, many years, and this is ultimately a gas pipeline. But one of the issues there is, as a gas pipeline or gas network of pipelines, um, there are issues around needing to give third party access, and also question marks around on the unbundling regimes under the third package. But broadly, the pipelines, the transportation of CO2 is governed under the Pipelines Act 1962 and the Gas Act of 1986. So those two are fairly well understood regimes for the actual transportation of the CO2. 
Um, for things like uh, the consenting regime, there's obviously the need to make sure that um, the relevant consents are in place for making sure these pipelines can be laid. An interesting question that comes up now is, can you reuse existing oil and gas pipelines for carbon capture and storage? And that's one of the sort of questions that has come up from government in its consultation last year, and the OGA has been looking at quite a lot. Um, if yes, then we'll need to resolve the questions of who deals with any kind of residual liability in those pipelines. And can they be repurposed for carrying CO2 as opposed to carrying oil or, or natural gas? Um, another one on here is land rights. So land rights is, is quite a patchwork um, in England and Wales. As you can imagine, there are a lot of landowners whose land would need to be crossed if you're building any kind of infrastructure project. In fact, another project that um, the CMS team work on, the going on land option was so problematic, partly because of land rights, that they decided to build offshore, which is obviously more complicated and more costly, but it was going to be achieved much faster. So the, the, the issues on land rights is that um, in the offshore space, there is a necessity to get a lease with the Crown Estate um, for both the pipeline in the territorial waters and then for the store probably out in the Renewable Energy Zone or UKCS. Um, the oceans around the little island that is the UK are getting somewhat congested because there are also quite a lot of renewable installations and oil and gas installations. And quite correctly, the Crown Estate takes the view that the first project who is there trumps rights over the project that is not yet there. But that does mean that it's, it's a little bit tricksy if you are preparing to build a project that is then impacted by a project that has come in and been built in the meantime. And so a more nimble, faster project may mean that it actually then trumps the rights of a carbon capture and storage project, which has just been slower to, to get off the ground. Um, and then onshore, there is the sort of normal sort of leasing arrangements and land rights that would need to apply. The, the sort of the overarching thing I think that we should also bear in mind is the helpful principle that applies to environmental liability in the UK, and that's the polluter pays principle. So when you look at the various laws and where they fit in, one thing that is always clear is that if there's environmental pollution, environmental liability, which could be also from CO2 leakage, the polluter pays. And so when we'll come to our slide with an example, that polluter pays principle can sometimes be slightly problematic if you can't trace where that CO2 molecule actually originated. Um, but if we think back, so those are just some of the ones where we have laws, but if we think back to the previous slide, Maybe I'll go back to the previous slides. So I've told you about the rights for a number of these areas. And yet there's quite, quite a few on here for which we haven't talked about the legal issues. And that's because they're not as well developed. So and most notably in hydrogen, we don't, we don't have the same levels of rules that would apply for the transportation, for, um, for the carrying of hydrogen, for the ability to use hydrogen in the heating networks. That is something that is currently being looked at and worked out, but is not in the level of development that we have for, say, um, the power CCS. There's also precious little that sort of deals with um, the waste sector and the kind of CO2 that could be captured from there. And the industry, the, the sort of the cement, lime, et cetera, making and CO2 capture from there is, is something that is again in development. But if you look at the areas on this slide that are developed, there are definitely gaps in relation to some areas compared to things like a straightforward power plant with an onshore offshore pipeline that goes to, a, to an offshore storage site. And I think that's something just to bear in mind 
as we think through the legal issues that one has to bear in mind when developing um, CCS projects. So here, now that you've heard, heard me, I'd like to hear maybe from you as to why, why do you think there are no commercial scale CCUS projects in, in the UK? Well, um, could, I, could I possibly say something just right at the beginning you, I can't remember the exact words, I'm sorry, uh, questioned public interest. I'm going to conjecture, if you like, that the public is very interested in having a CCS. Of course, if you ask them, what are the constraints? Uh, they don't want CCS at the cost of their jobs or anything, but I think they very much do want uh, CCS. And scientifically, it can clearly go ahead. There are the legal problems that you mentioned, I well understand that, and the commercial problems, but it would be, if the politician said it should go ahead, it would. Okay, so so your your answer to why are there no commercial scale CCS projects is let's blame the politicians. Uh, that's a little strong, but that's <laughs> uh, it's very much. It's not only the politicians. There are some things I know, but I can't say. But it's not only. But the politicians could play a big role if uh, Trump and Bojo and in Australia the Prime Minister said, we should definitely go ahead with CCS. Well, yeah. Um, can I can I just add that I think, um, like, so the, the thing, the problem with public interest is that they, not everyone really um, understands um, the impact of CCS. So a lot of people think that we are pushing for CCS because we want to essentially use fossil fuels for the next 50 to 100 years. And they're like, no, 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 we shouldn't we need, really need to like, you know, stop using fossil fuels. Um, and I think even aside from fossil fuels, I, I think they don't, like, it's not understandable that if we do it with CCS, it should be okay. And I think aside from that, also like um, the public aren't aware that we needed to decarbonize industries, for example. It's like aside from um, the power industry, we have industries like cement and steel and transport and all of that where we really need to decarbonize. Um, and then also like um, DAC and BECS and stuff like that. Um, and I think all of those play a role that the, where the public aren't really aware of all of this. Um, and I do agree that politicians or people that just kind of have a bigger platform, if they kind of, you know, highlight all of that, um, it would be really good. Because right now everyone, the, the major thing public know about is like renewable energy. And they're like, we really, and like they put fossil fuels in a way that looks really, really bad, which they are in their current state if we're not really capturing the carbon dioxide. Um, but that does change with CCS. No, I, think, I think you make a very good point. Yeah. Um, the, it's very difficult to have the same emotional attachment when someone hears the word carbon capture or usage and storage than when someone hears the solar plant. Um, it's just very difficult to sell them in the same bucket. And um, for, for many years, a carbon capture and storage was part of enhanced oil recovery, which in some people's minds then allows them to associate it with things like shale, shale um, exploration. And um, I, think, I think that is definitely an image that um, the carbon capture and storage industry has been trying to change, but perhaps it's, it's one that's difficult to, to move people off quickly. Um, could I add, it's Richard McCrory here, um, add in on that. And I'm, I'm not quite sure, listening to Herbert, um, to say that the public are fully supportive of this. I, I, I tend to agree that I don't think either the public either doesn't have the context of it, what are we really going to be using this for? And also, you know, it is very, you've only got to look at the, the fracking debate that happened in the UK, particularly in UK and mainland Europe and storage sites on land. UK seems to be offshore, which helps a bit. But it's very easy to, and I think unless the government provides a very, what they, their vision of this technology is. And I go back to the European Directive, which in the preamble says very clearly, this is a bridging technology to a future world. You know, it's, we're not going to use it for more than so many years just to get us there. Now, I don't know whether that is industry's view of the technology or whether that is the government's view, because it doesn't seem to be they ever stated very clearly. But it seems to me if we, if we, 
don't want to see what happened with fracking and other things where the press, the public and the NGOs can get very worked up. Um, then there has to be a very clear, how, how do we see this technology? Is it simply a way of getting us to 100% um, reduction, but no more? And we actually then want to look at other things so we don't actually use carbon capture in 100 years time. But I'm not, I'm not very clear what the government really, and, and indeed what the industry really views on that. Well, could I just say, yeah. I agree with you, it's a difficult problem, but it was said right at the beginning, the public are not in favour of it. And that I, I believe is not at all correct. So I think, I think an issue uh, is sometimes we want quite quick answers. Um, so CMS published a report in January where we took at the energy transition. And that particular report looked at what the oil and gas sector is doing in relation to energy transition. But for me, what was really interesting is energy transitions take about 70 years to go, you know, from start to finish. And I think sometimes when we look at wanting to address climate change and um, address the, the impacts of it, we want a quick solution. And we also have politicians who work in very short terms. So we just aren't looking at it from a lens that allows us to think about it in, in decades, um, which, you know, coming to the, to the point of, is, is it a bridging technology? Well, if it's a bridging technology, we still need to actually get onto this bridge. It's now been 10 years since the CCS directive came out, and we're still struggling to get some more CCS projects out in Europe. So I, I think a lot of it is, I mean, I, I don't disagree that there is definitely a role that politics and government can play in it. Um, I think we are responsible as citizens as well for the kind of politicians that we put into, into offices. But I think a large part of it is that things like large infrastructure projects of which carbon capture and storage projects are, just take a very long term mindset, which many of us don't normally have. Can I just add an answer to um, Herbert? I mean, all our surveys, for a very long time, far too long, show that the public have no idea what carbon capture is. I mean, I think, um, you know, whether it's, it's one thing to debate whether people like or don't like nuclear, but at least they know what it is. Most people asked about what carbon capture and storage is really don't even know what, what problem it's addressing. So David, you're making my point about, is it a solar plant or is it, yeah, what is this yeah. thing? Yeah. People know what solar, you know, people know solar and can debate offshore wind and onshore wind and can debate nuclear plants. They, there is no debate over carbon capture and storage largely. I mean, you, you know, you go to these and we'll find it. We, we were all in a big room. I remember after the, the chancellor canceled the last competition and everybody in the room agreed that it should go ahead. But there, you know, there, there's no support. I mean, I think that's, that's a serious problem. But, but David, yeah, and, and, oh, sorry, David, the public have very little idea of many things. If you ask them about HS2, what would they really understand about HS2 and what was involved there? Uh, uh, the, the only thing I objected to was right at the beginning, the state was made, I'm sorry, I should have written it down exactly. The public are not keen on it. And I just don't think that's true. I agree they don't know all the details, anywhere near all the details. And of course, if you ask them, it depends how you ask them, it's the old story. But it's not, it's, and I think your application of nuclear, and I may be having an Australian uh, background here, in Australia, nuclear is absolutely impossible. You couldn't get nuclear through no matter what you did. Uh, it's different. I believe even here, nuclear and uh, carbon capture and storage have different attitudes so people have different attitudes no but but there is no attitude i think yeah i mean i think the problem is you know people in germany might like nuclear less than people in france but at least there's a you know it might be somewhat poor or poor debate but there is a debate there is no debate in in we did a, a focus group in in peterhead after the project was cancelled and uh you know essentially one person out of 18 or something had heard of the project. <laughs> so I, I think I think it's it's really a and that's why I think it is a debate, you know, legal commercial. The, I think these 
arguably these issues matter more because it's completely out of out of the public eye for better or for worse yeah i do i, I do okay. agree like i think um i think like people that we are surrounded with yes definitely know what ccs is and obviously they're very keen about it but i think if we talk about in terms of like the general public like people that might have never worked in ccs or which are probably the majority um all of them would probably be like yes we should do renewable i totally agree and then if you talk to them about ccs they probably wouldn't they'd either not know what it is about and people that do know what it is about um they'd be like oh no we really need because like they're only the, the people that do know about it they're only i think they're only um, you know, idea of CCS is that we're going to use this because we want to still use fossil fuels for the next 50 to 100 years. Um, and they're very against that. So to them, fossil fuels is like a bad word, whereas renewable is more like, yes, we should push for that. Um, yeah, I think um, a lot of people maybe don't think that CCS is even necessary. We hear all the time about the progress being made in renewables. Obviously, we know it's, it's not sufficient and we do need to still capture CO2, but a lot of people think, well, why? Why would we want to do this? If they do know anything about it, it's a big, dirty industry um, out in the North Sea again. And it's like, well, we're, we're making progress as we are, and we're planting trees. So I, I don't think many of the public know quite how um, dire the situation has got. Can I, um can I, Sorry, can can I, I offer just, uh, another uh, another answer into this, and maybe then let us continue on, and then see if see if you if you disagree. So I was going to say that one answer might be is the risk allocation, and how we we deal with the, some of the uncertainties around what carbon capture and storage projects involve. And if if you're happy for me to to continue. I think ultimately what risk allocation comes down to is the, the very simple question of who pays for what, when, and what do we do if there are problems. So if we look at what happened on demo two, and you know, many of us were involved in demo, demos one and demos two, it was about what the risk allocation is when you have so if you look at the top right hand corner, you had electricity being generated by the capture plant up here. It then would flow down into the tra transportation, possibly to a buffer store, but then go on to offshore transport here shown by a ship, but it was really going to be a, a pipeline, um, be piped out and then injected into a store. And only once it was injected into a store would the payment under the revenue contract be paid to the electricity generation all the way up in the beginning. And, and so the situation was, who was going to pay? It was going to be the, a low carbon capture company, the LCCC under the CFD. But it was only going to pay once the whole process went through and the plant was able to show that it could actually inject the CO2 and keep it in the ground. What that meant is, if you look at these sort of funny shaped stars, is that we created areas where we were asking ourselves, well, what happens when there is this junction? What happens if the capture plant, once it's captured the CO2, cannot put it into the pipeline, or once it puts it into the pipeline onshore, it can't transport it offshore, or heaven forbid, it can't inject it in the store. Or if you look at it from the other perspective, if you put it into the store and then it leaks, if you trace it back up the chain and there are two capture plants, which capture plant did it come from? Who do you blame? So who do you allocate the risk to? And I think it's dealing with that sort of uncertainties in terms of the liabilities is where our legal issues and commercial issues intersect. Because quite correctly, the CCS directive says, put it in the ground and keep it in the ground and keep monitoring it. And if stuff goes wrong, pay for cleaning it up. But if you put it in a business model whereby the only money, the only revenue for the project comes up one end, 
and it then has to pay everybody else, including for any kind of pollution cleanup. It means at every part that there is a risk point, someone needs to consider and price in how they want to deal with that risk. Um, the other issue that I think comes up in the UK and also in a number of other countries is there's no value for CO2 by itself. It's a waste product. So it, in you know, Norway, US, we can, we can create some value from the, from the CO2, also from sort of enhanced EOR, but that's not the case in the UK. So when we, we talk about the willingness for people to, to pay for this, to have this, we're effectively asking them for something a little bit more expensive than they could achieve in the alternative. And if there is no clear benefit that they see, there's no value that they see in this, it's very difficult to, to, to understand why you should pay more for something that you can get an alternative for. So that was, that was really kind of what happened on demo two. We had, we had the, the legal frameworks, but it's in the who pays for what and when that there were just a few too many areas where it was not very clear of what happens especially if there are problems. And just have a look at this table that is in a great report by the Global CCS Institute. These are just some of the legal and commercial risks and the impacts on the cost of the project. So it's no surprise everybody knows that CCS projects are very capital intensive. And if you can't um, legislate for it, if there's no legal or policy framework for it, then, then you basically need to price for it. If from the table of the policy priorities to incentivize CCS that the Global CCS Institute published last year, um, it's very clear that the higher the risk, the higher the premium, and the first one that is at the top of the list is the cross-chain risk. So the ones that we talked about, how different junctions end up increasing the risk. And if you look at the numbers in terms of the risk premium, it goes from 4% of lower risk lending rate to 15%, which is the high, high risk lending rate. Um, when you think about the fact that this, there's debt service costs, that's basically tens of millions that would be impacted, which then asks the question of how investable is a project. So when we think about what are the barriers, I think, in terms of commercial scale CCS projects in the UK, it's the ones that are here. It's the cross chain, the policy and the storage liability, um, which are the ones that are hampering it. And it's making sure that the right to risk allocation can be applied so that we don't end up pricing in for these sorts of risks. And to be fair to, to UK government, they have been they have been learning from this. So if we look at what's been happening in the last five years when demo two ended, and this is just looking at what the government has been publishing rather than all the excellent reports have been sort of going around, both looking back at what happened in demo two, but also proposing other solutions. Um, so I think it's fair to say 2016 was a bit of a, let's just take stock year. Um, and then in 2017, the government came up with two policies that have since been driving where, where it wants to go on, on energy. The first one was the clean growth strategy in October 2017. And then shortly after that, it was followed by the industrial strategy in November 2017. So in both of those, it seemed to start picking up on the fact that the way Demo2 projects were set up wasn't really working, that there were, there were risks that were just too great for the industry to bear. So what the clean growth strategy does is it introduces the idea that they will build on what was learned in the offshore wind industry for CCS. One of the kind of very easy retorts to say back is that offshore wind took a very long time to get to where it is, but it's a fantastic ambition. You know, if offshore wind got there and uh, someone who's done offshore wind projects for a long time, it was expensive, it was really difficult. A lot of the sort of questions that we come on first of its kind projects like CCS were there for offshore wind. So if we could do it for offshore wind such that the prices are now 
incredibly low and uh, you know there's a great parity for onshore wind at least uh, with uh, with gas and coal um, why not do it for carbon capture and storage um, the next year another thing that came out that was that was quite exciting for the CCUS world and that's the CCUS action plan and that was basically the government saying look we really are committing to trying to look at what carbon capture and storage can do for us. So it's said in there that CCS will be essential to meet the ambition set out in the Paris Agreement. Um, it recognized that CCS deployment has the potential to support decarbonization in several ways, such as uh, flexible gas generation, to decarbonize many of the industrial processes, and to bring back jobs to the industrial centers and also to decarbonize heat. What, what this has also done is it put a timeline on, right? So they said they would like to enable the deployment of first CCS facilities in the UK to be commissioning from mid 2020s. And so in many ways, the kind of the policy ambition that was perhaps lacking in the previous year suddenly appeared on the table. Of course, just putting a policy ambition on the table is not enough and the government needs to keep doing more, which is why it's good that in July 2019, we then have a business models consultation, um, whereby some of, the, some of the risks that were identified before, some of the challenges, is what the government is looking to address. What would have been really nice is if in November this year, we actually had some announcements about all the things that the government has since done. That's not gonna happen. We now get extra, what, six, 12 months to, on which to make progress. Yeah, but hopefully there will be progress. So let's just recap for those that um, might not know what the government said it was going to do in terms of the business model consultation. Largely, it's about breaking that CCS full chain model that we looked at at our example, to try and deal with the risks that were on that table, the cross chain risk, um, but also dealing with the stranded asset risk, and potentially also even deal with the long-term storage leakage risks. So there are three different um, revenues and models that the consultation has proposed. If we, are, if we are fair, it's actually one that is being really advanced through the consultation, partly because all the, all the work that the industry groups have done. The other two are sort of on, on their way. So the main one is about the power CCS and to create a different kind of revenue model, which is the dispatchable CFD, so that um, it, there is a recognition for the flexibility services that uh, CCS projects can provide to the overall energy system. In splitting it from the um, transportation storage, so before you know how the, the power plant would only get paid once the CO2 is stored, the split would be that the power plant would get paid once the CO2 is in the transportation system. And then the transportation and storage system would be regulated much more like a network. So under a regulated asset base model. This would mean that you are not dependent on the payments from the capture company, but would be separately uh, paying for fee just for being available as a network. The issue there becomes a little bit about who's using the network. Do you have the demand? Because the stranded asset risk is still there because if you build a transportation and storage system that is too small, then the other capture or industrial plant that come and want to use it can't. If you build one that's too large and there isn't a demand, you've effectively overpaid for an asset that nobody really needs. So that is still a question mark that needs to be resolved. But having a regulated asset base that is separate from a revenue contract for the power or eventually or whatever will happen for the industrial CCS, means that at least that point of risk has moved away. Now, there is still a question mark whether it's right to put transport and storage together. Are they the same entities? Are they going to be doing the same things? Should you have split it further down? 
that's not currently on offer, but at least one of the kind of risk elements has, has been taken away. The other thing that the government is considering in the, in the consultation is that it has recognized that the risk of escape of stored CO2 is incredibly low. But it does say that it's a long-term risk and that the current difficulty is finding affordable insurance cover for it. So it's very difficult to price for it. And so there is recognition that perhaps in this case, like the government does in other industries, it can stand behind some of that risk. That is actually quite a big move because the unknown nature of the CO2 liability has been a problem for C CCS projects for a long time and has been one of the sort of criticisms of the CCS directive for the 10 years that it's existed. So I, so I think that's, that's quite helpful in the fact that um, it's now at least worked on some of the issues that were recognized in 2015. There are still issues though that we don't yet know what's happening on the industrial CCS. There's no base preferred model and there's definitely nothing on the hydrogen production. Now we know this is something that Bayes is looking at, but at the moment that is a gap that if you're developing CCS projects and you're trying to see, well, what law would we be working under? We don't actually know. We don't actually have a coherent um, legal framework for some of this. So what would it look like on a split chain CCS project? Same sort of diagram, this time the star is red. Um, but just to kind of bring back that message is this time around, the plan is that you would have the generation company, which would own the facility, and it still needs to have its other contracts for like the grid connection and the power purchase agreement. But once it generates power, it would then get paid by the CFD counterparty, which is the right-hand quarter under the, under the dispatchable CFD, which means that in our risk model and our kind of normal allocation of contractual risk between the projects, we have much more of a self-contained entity whereby the shareholders and the lenders can be much more comfortable with where the revenue comes from and that the fact that it comes to the power generation company once that CO2 is transferred into the transportation and storage company, rather than as in the first example, we had to wait until the CO2 is stored in the ground. What we don't yet fully uh, have developed is the, the TNS fee and in terms of how that would, be, that would be channeled. Because even if you say it's going to be regulated under a regulated asset-based model, it still needs to be paid by somebody. In this current example, if we're talking about an electricity generation capture company, then there is sense in having the TNS fee being paid by electricity consumers. What happens if the people who are using the transportation and storage are not electricity consumers? It's, it's difficult to see why they should be made to pay it. So it may need to come from, from other users. So for industrial CCS, electricity consumers might not be the right answers for the people for whom the liability for the TNS fee is gonna come. So that's the kind of difference between the risk allocation on the full chain model and the split chain model. Um, and I guess the, the question is, is that, is that enough? Is, is what we currently have sufficient for um, delivering the kind of legal framework we need for carbon capture and storage projects in the UK? And guess what? You get to answer this. So, Karis, would you mind trying to do another poll of how far does the revised split chain business model enable the development of commercial scale CCS projects in the UK? I think the poll is working this time. Fabulous. You can see. Okay. 
Um, so I think most people will have responded. Um, Vic, are you happy to publish, please? Oh, people are still voting. <laughs> Okay, is it letting you view it, Dahlia, or shall I read out the percentages for you? If you wouldn't mind reading out, I'm unfortunately still blind as to what it says. Yeah, so we've got 22% of people have said the most of the way, 41% of people have said some of the way, 11% of people have said little of the way, and 26% of people have said they don't know or have no opinion. Excellent. Um, well, I think that that's that's a perfect place for us to kind of continue on this conversation. Sorry, now I need to go back to sharing screen. Um, and, and I think I think that's a that's a very fair split because um, we actually don't have don't have the evidence yet because we don't have a project uh, to show how much of a difference this is going to make. We know that the government wants to have at least two commercial CCS projects developing by mid 2020s. And I had hoped that by November 2016, we'd have some further news as to what that might look like. We don't yet. Um, and I, I think it's interesting that there is an even split between most of the way and don't know, no opinion. Um, I'd be quite, quite curious to kind of explore that, that further. Because I, I think one of the issues that's still remaining my personal perspective is there's still no value to the CO2 and so we're still dealing with the with the issue of we're trying to increase the price of an overall project um, but actually we don't value a large part of what it does at least not, not in not in monetary terms and so then it just adds cost to the overall project um, which people I think quite rightly would say well what's the alternative So um, with that, I was going to stop talking here or stop mostly talking here and leave us uh, some time for a discussion. Um, so if you, if you wanna speak up or there's a chat um, box at the bottom where you can write your questions, happy to answer it that way. Um, I think we've got about Thank you, 25 Dahlia, minutes. I have a question if that's okay. Of course. Thank you. Um, you were you were talking about environmental damages earlier, and um, you you said generally the um, polluter pays. Um, in this case, the the what could be spilled, I guess, is is CO two, which although it's a pollutant, it would have gone into the atmosphere anyway. So does that in some way lower the risk of um, a polluter having to pay damages if the CO2 were to um, leak from storage and enter the sea or atmosphere where it would have gone had it not been captured in the first place. Is that in any way a, a positive thing? Well, I think it's a positive thing if you compare it to something like oil and gas. Um, yeah. it, it would not be a Maconda type of impact. At the same time, a large CO2 plume would asphyxiate fish effectively around it. So okay. um, not, not the greatest. I think the other element of it is, um, so if you store the CO2, you then don't pay the EU ETS uh, liabilities. Whereas uh, clearly if, if the CO2 is back up in the atmosphere, uh, that then no longer applies and there should be a payment of yeah. The CO2 so, so I guess if there was a, any knowledge of how much CO2 had, had escaped, then that would probably have to, I mean, that's essentially a shared portion of all the companies who were storing CO2 in that reservoir. And so it would be split between them. It, it doesn't belong to any one of them, one of the companies, I guess. Yeah, I guess I guess the issue becomes is if it's a really long term, like, you know, 50 years down the line, some of those companies don't exist or some of those companies only, only put their CO2 in for five years and then for the remaining 45, they weren't involved, you know, how much should they pay? And especially if CO2 migrates, who, whose fault is it? 
And then you come to that kind of classic lawyer's debate of what caused this? You know, whose CO2 molecule blew this darn thing? And, and so I, I think, I mean, I wouldn't want to go anywhere near trying to apportion liability of who is actually at fault. Right now with, with sort of COVID-19, we're seeing a lot of question marks around obligations and sort of force majeure. And already on something completely you know, mundane, you're going with, okay, so you haven't done this bit because your people couldn't turn up and they didn't turn up because their government's not letting them outside of the house and they couldn't deliver eggs because there are actually no ships that are transferring any of these goods. Whose fault is it and who gets relief? Um, yeah. And we're talking about delivery of kit. Um, this would be this would be really quite complicated, and I think that's part of the reason why nobody really wants to price for it, because ultimately it's just going to be a, a large, large amount of pain and and money. Even if I think you're absolutely right, it's not as dangerous as an oil spill. Mm. So I guess it would be down to good bookkeeping as to how much CO two from who went into which reservoir and how and how far away from the borehole that CO2 may have traveled. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's that kind of monitoring. And frankly, I'm not an engineer. I don't know how easy it is to monitor CO2 migration in a porous underground um, environment. But I think, I think there is something around the monitoring plan and making sure that's sufficiently robust. Um, also, I think the studies say that the risk of leakage is very, very low. So it's, it's just dealing with that, you know, unknown unknown or known unknown in our case, um, mm -hmm. that it's very difficult to, to, to do it. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, Isabella, you've just asked the question of, should there be a guarantee fund to deal with long-term liability? And, and, and I think there could be things like that because in the nuclear world, for example, or um, other offshore wind, we could, we could put money aside whereby there is a fund, there is a pot of money which people share. At the moment, there aren't people to put money into this fund and there's no money to put into the fund from, from, from the case, right? So yes, um, so for example, on offshore wind, you build up your decommissioning fund because uh, you still need to decommission, take your turbines out of the sea, clean up the sea, make sure everything's still as, as good as how you found it. So you build up that fund over the lifetime of the project. I think the similar thing would be done for CCS projects. So you build up a fund from the revenues that the project is getting during its life to deal with any kind of long-term liabilities up to a cap. And then at some point, like it is with nuclear, the government steps, steps in. Um, but we need, we need some projects in order to have some of the revenue to put it into a bank. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Wasn't that... So my understanding from conversation with folks is that that was the case with some of the, the, the previous run of, of competition so that they did have to put 100 million up, of capital up ahead of time, um, you know, to cover the subsequent cost of, of, of leakage if it, if it occurred. And this was sort of put, this was like a bunch of capital that was going to be put into, um, basically put into, put into an account to pay for leakage down the road. I mean, does that make it, does that ring true to you? Um, there are some guarantee obligations when you apply for your appraisal wells. You've just got to stand behind, um, basically behind your liabilities there. I think that may be what you're referring to. Mm -hmm. And then to pick up on sort of what you finished on and what I think Louise might have been speaking about, I mean, there's this lack of value proposition. I mean, not for a second suggesting that it's as simple as this, but I mean, is this just not as, not as, not a case of the carbon price is too low? And so therefore, you know, gas CCS or whatever is uncompetitive with unabated CCS or unabated gas plants and, and so on and so forth. I mean, is it not? I think the carbon price. Sorry. Yeah, I think, I think the carbon price is, is, is a big factor. I mean, any kind of value proposition on CO2 is a big factor. It's, it's not just CO2 that we have this problem with. We have this problem with water. There are certain things we just don't place a value on. And as we know, when something is free, you don't have the same attitude to it than when you pay for it. And uh, I, I don't know what the right answer is, whether it is the carbon price, because the, the trouble with the carbon price is that it then can impact your competitiveness against people who don't have a carbon price. Mm -hmm. And to have a whole global network that has 
that has a commitment to a global carbon price is proving you know impossible we can't even agree on what we're going to report our ndcs in under in, in paris you know let alone try and agree how do we actually want to stand behind pricing uh, some of some of the pollution that we cause now on that i i do think that there, there possibly is some hope in terms of the thinking. I think more and more of the oil and gas companies are coming out saying we are committed to net zero and we are committed to net zero, not just for what we do, but also for scope three emissions. Mm. And so I think it's shining that light on um, where, are the, where are the emissions and how much, how much do we pay for them mm. it, it is is at least bringing some of that debate to the to the front. I don't I don't think it's an easy answer, but at least that yeah. shi shines a little bit of a torch on it. And but just to play with that a little bit more, I mean, so you're 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 talking about sort of global, you know, carbon clubs and so on. Mm. So in order to do the carbon, in in order to deploy CCS on power, so just let's you know make the problem a bit simpler within one country. I mean, that's down to political will within one country, surely. Or yeah. within one, one, you know, within Europe or whatever, you know, you, you can, I mean, this is something that we can more or less specify. And is there a difference, you know, I mean, I, so I think that there's probably quite a significant difference between the sufficient and necessary conditions required to deliver successfully a first and perhaps second, third project versus mm -hmm. the enduring models and regime that will be required to deliver something that's a bit more business as usual at the you know end of a kind. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, I was reading a great quote only the other day about how you can't create and edit at the same time. And I have a feeling that that's what we mm -hmm. try to do quite a lot of the time. We we don't want to make a mistake so we were trying to edit what our first carbon and capture storage project should look like mm. whereas as with any first of its kind project the first one is going to be more difficult it is going to be more expensive because we're learning on the job and it's the it's that learning that we then take to our second third tenth project so that over time it becomes routine and we don't think about it and we have fine-tuned some of the issues that we faced originally I mean, if you look if you look at the renewable projects that were done 10 years ago and the renewable projects that are being built now they're, they're, they're worlds apart but you know we had to start somewhere and i think i think there is definitely a bit of a problem in us trying to edit while we create ccs mm. um could can i ask a question it's richard mccrory here of course yeah yep. Um, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer, and, I'm, and this again particularly related to the UK, and thank you very much, and I'm beginning to understand full chains and split chains much more than I did before. Um, it's a question actually I asked John Gibbons, and he very sent in his first talk, and he very sensibly declined to answer. But given that post-Brexit, presumably the UK will have the freedom to um, not necessarily follow the EU directive completely, it can change bits of it. Personally, are there any bits of the directive you would now change to uh, encourage the industry? I mean, I've got, just to give you a hint, I mean, I've got three or two main ones. One, I think that the, although it's a long way down the line, the conditions for post-closure transferring to eventually to a government, which nearly all legislation in the world has at some point, that the, mm -hmm. the state picks up the responsibility. I mean, if you read the directive strictly, it's, it's, it's done in very absolute terms and almost impossible for the scientists would say you couldn't comply with it. And quite different if you look at Australian legislation or Canadian, which is a bit more reasonably done. Um, I also think that the, uh, the upfront financial security, I don't know where it's got to now, but the upfront financial security linked to emissions trading and trying to predict that down the line, what the library what was actually a great mistake. It was based sort of on the landfill directive. And I think they thought there are going to be lots of little industries who might suddenly go bust and things like that. And I, I'm not sure. I think that was a problem. And also, but that gets very technical. I know that there is some really complicated issues if you're trying to combine enhanced oil recovery with 
um, a storage site and the kind of quality of the fuel. But there are little aspects, and I just don't know if anybody's working on this or think it's a problem and think, well, that's actually, we can live with the directive and it's the other issues that you've highlighted are more important. So I just wonder whether you have any views on that. Yeah, well, I, I think it's interesting. Is anybody else here who has been looking at this before I answer that? Um, feel free to jump in. No, okay. Um, so I think there are, I, th I think the CCS directive actually started from a really good place, but like you, I have a feeling it started with what was its normal then. So the landfill directive is a perfect example. It was thinking in the kind of Kyoto world of this is the kind of projects we're going to see and the landfill directive is trying to encourage this, so why don't we piggyback on the same things. I think the world we're now living in is, is much more penetrated with renewables, much more decentralized, and there is, there is a question mark as should we take a step back and say is the CO2 directive still what we want? I think the financial security is a really good point. Um, it fits with state aid and I think the state aid regime, whether it's on the WTO or the, the European Commission is still quite, quite necessarily stringent. And so I, I think, I, I question how much we can do. I think there is there's something that we should be able to do in terms of where, when the government can step, step behind and step um, and, and guarantee some of those provisions and liabilities, because I think it is creating issues around long-term storage liability. Um, but I, I think we've got to be really wary of, of what the state aid regime will do. I also don't think it takes any into account of, you know, things like the hydrogen economy. I think we've, we've, we should also think about what does, do we want to store this CO2 or do we want to use it? Because you can't do, you can't do, well, you know, like you say with EOR, there's also the use of, of CO2 is not encouraged by the directive, quite clearly because no one no one really thought about it. But um, also should it incentivize using, um, using hydrogen, using CO2 for cleaning up some of that hydrogen production and then in, in industrial processes, um, which might be a chance. That said, it works, you know, something that we know and we have understood. So if we can, if we can deal with uh, some of these issues through our, our risk allocation and through contractual means, I'd be tempted to leave the directive alone and just focus on actually getting some projects built. Because my experience of, say, the electricity market reform, which only took two, three years to kind of to push through from sort of 2010, we started talking about the renewables obligation changing to CFDs to 2013 when the Energy Act 2013 came into law. That, that, that uncertainty, that period of, we don't know whether we're coming or going and what sort of terms we're gonna get is, is really quite damaging. So I think we've, we've lost enough time on not building CCS projects that maybe we should just get on and use the tools we have to to start to start building i'd say I'd, I'd probably agree with that and i certainly think we were talking earlier about public confidence if you government started doing proposals which felt like that they were producing relaxations on the regulatory regime which the rest of europe has that could be easily exploited and not attract public confidence but it's just whether there are any yeah. you know showstoppers which we've now got the flexibility we well next January we should have the flexibility to change if we wanted to. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's all right. We've got a question from actually three Johns in the chat um, so far. So John Henderson, is he still here? Um, I'll move on to John Gibbons. He has his hand up and a question in the chat. Uh, so this is the one about what's my view of of what the 800 million the budget is for and, and how would the project it? have to get it oh how yeah. to get it oh gosh million dollar question john no um, I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> well about a thousand still yes carry on yeah. <laughs> um so i guess i guess the first um point is um i think i think it would be through the cost of model i think the government has very much bought into the idea that it's not just going to be supporting a project that is solo to its own little bit. It needs to be something that demonstrates value to the region. Um, 
And I know that, you know, for example, the task force, when it looked at what the business uh, plans would be, it, it looked at what's the, what's the overall value to the region, to the jobs, to the industry in that region, do the local um, authorities there support this plan? I think, I think that is still a very valuable proposition because if you're going to, if you're going to build this um, industry, you need to know that you're effectively getting bang for the buck. So my view would be that if there is 800 million in the budget, it should go towards um, a project that has, that can demonstrate that maximum sort of value and benefit to the region where it's, where it's situated. And, and we, we only it, have what, like five or six clusters, so it'll probably be one of them. Well, I mean, the budget said one by 2025 and another by 2030, so it isn't, it's not an unlimited number. But do you think it's just for transport and storage, or do you think it could be for other things? Um, I, well, I think I think the rumor is it's for transport and storage. Um, that's what I'm hearing. Um, it depends on what what the capture facility is, because if it's say say a, an industrial petrochemical cement factory, um, that might justify additional funding. Whether it gets it from the budget from this 800 million or from one of the other sort of funds that the UKRI is running, I don't know. I don't know if that, that bit wasn't very clear to me as to whether this is a encompassing all eight, 800 million or there are other little bits of competitions that are running that may be possible to get it. But it would, it would make sense that if you're trying to incentivize the building of a larger transportation system, then you currently have demand for that you might do that through a grant. Thanks. That's my personal view. I have absolutely no idea what the Treasury is thinking, or if they're no. still thinking the same things you were thinking in the beginning of March. No, well, it certainly won't be, but, uh, but anyway, at least they said it then. And I'm afraid, Paolo, I have no idea who the winners are. Um, I think if you talk to, talk to anyone in that project, uh, they feel like they always are the winners, whether it's Acorn or Teesside or Humber or, or, or um, Wales, I think everyone has got to feel like they are putting their best foot forward. Um, but ultimately it'll come down to what is, the, what is the business plan that they are putting forward and how much benefit I think they bring to, to the region. And, and, and I think also it depends on kind of how much money is there, right? So um, during the project contract negotiations on demo two, um, it, there was a billion pounds on the table and yet the projects were incredibly expensive. So you had to sort of think about what did that billion get you? So it, 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 it could be that if you're smaller and more nimble, you are, you are more attractive. It depends on kind of what the aims are of, um, of trying to get, what kind of CCS project we want to start with. I think that will determine quite a lot of who the more attractive proposition is. Um, we've got a question here as well on, um, from John Henderson, which is how does BEX work without a value for CO2? I don't know if that's a, what you think on so that. So how, how do you, um, is this kind of in the, uh, John, I don't know if you're there, still there to sort of expand on your question. Are you thinking in the context of sort of what Drax is doing? Yeah, it is. Um, the discussion you've had uh, so far has been very much industrial uh, CO2 um, from traditional power generation and the revenue coming from power generation. The theory behind BEX is that the value is in the uh, uh, stored carbon, isn't it? Which is yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, sequestered and, and, and therefore negative, theoretically. Yeah, so I think both direct air capture and BEX, um, are, I think, are incredibly valuable. I think what Drax is doing... Um, I, I, I think it's really interesting the fact that they've you know, they're able to show that they can capture they can capture the CO2 and hopefully the in time can also store it. Um, how does it work without a value of CO2? Well, I think I think that is the current challenge. We don't we, we you know for example the biomass plant that Drax currently operate have the renewables obligation support right. Once that ends, it's it's a, it's going to be probably a, a CFD. Um, for any kind of new new plant, so a BEX plant that that comes in, and then the then the, where that price for that CFD is set 
um, will sort of depend on the kind of on the dispatchable CFD. There is a kind of a concept of a of a reference plant, and so it's setting setting the value there. But it's it's going to be ultimately come down to sort of the the modeling that is done, which was, if you look at, for example, on the Hinkley Point C contract, um, the and that contract is public, um, the value and the openers there are all very much based off a model that was shared as part of the bilateral negotiations. So I think it would it would be the same sort of negotiation for our BEX CCS project. Thanks. That's all right. Um, um, is John N still on the line? Um, so we've got a question from John N, um, who's asking, how about a regulator that takes a levy on the stored CO2? Do you want to expand on that, John? Potentially not able to hear us. Uh, I can hear you. Sorry, I need to unmute. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, in other cases where we're trying to share risk and manage multiple systems, uh, we've established regulators who uh, take a small levy and build a contingency fund, fund just in case things go wrong. And they usually have inspection duties and keep an eye on things and have some regulatory enforcement powers. Um, those sort of structures have been put in, in other situations. I just wonder if... Uh, there's a sort of forward thinking here and begin to put those sort of structures in. So when you've got multiple um, CO2 storages, there's a regulator that's overall responsible. Everyone chips in their bit in the levy um, and some of the risks are mitigated rather than trying to do it through an insurance model. Yeah, so I think um, if, if transportation and storage go forward on a ramp based model, then there'll need to be a license, um, which will need to have a regulator that looks after it. And um, whether that is enough to, to build up enough of a store to cover the sort of liabilities as opposed to insurance, I don't know. It depends on, uh, I mean, my, my personal view, and that might be biased just because of the kind of projects that I've been involved in, is that insurance is probably a bit more um, reliable and possibly cheaper. I don't actually know if that's if I don't have any evidence to kind of back that up, but that's sort of my my gut feeling. But I think if you have you do need a regulator. If you're going to have a regulated regulated model of networks, you will need to have a regulated um, a regulator who stands behind it. That may be Ofgem or maybe the OGA, which are the kind of the two natural ones to, to think about. Um, in terms of kind of looking at the other networks. We don't really have um, a store for, say, offshore transmission lines. Um, the the, the offtos themselves build up their own their own decommissioning funds. Um, similarly, National Grid uh, looks after its own sort of wires. So I'm not I'm not sure that that would um, that would necessarily work in the UK context. I, I, I'm very happy to be proved wrong. Yeah, and Niall was going to say exactly that, is that some people are, are thinking about self-insurance and whether that's, that's an option. Obviously, you've got, to be, you've got to be big enough in order to, to have that as a, even an option to think about. But yeah, that is, that is also a possibility. Uh, Tim Dixon here. Can I just uh, ask for clarification on something? Of course. Hi, Dahlia. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, interesting presentation on the UK regulatory framework. In the first half, you mentioned the London Protocol and the export prohibition, and the UK was one of the five or six that, that it ratified. Um, that, that, um, that prohibition was resolved in the annual meeting in, in October. It was. You're absolutely right. It was. So yes. thanks, thanks very much to Norway, who put a resolution in for provisional application. And so whilst we still want countries to ratify the original amendment in 2009, um, there's no longer a barrier. Countries can proceed for the export of CO2 for geological storage offshore. So just wanted to make sure that no, was- No, thank you, thank you. That, that was uh, as I was saying it, I was wondering, I was just like something around this 
makes me think I'm missing something. No, you're absolutely right. Yeah, it's not, um, there's, lots, there's lots of sort of problems and issues and things in, and, and you've raised them and addressed them and you talk very well, but there's, we've got a nice positive on that one. So just Absolutely, because sure uh, you, 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 you remind me actually that we was having a chat with someone who wants us to not only shop to, sh ship to Norway, but also to Rotterdam and sort of create a little triangle whereby mm. we can reduce some of that risk. I think, I think that would be fantastic because being dependent on one store, if that goes out, I just think it's, it's sort of slightly crazy. I mean, if, you're, if your car breaks down, you go take public transport or something, right? Or you, take, you, you, you find another, yeah. another vehicle. Whereas if you're solely dependent on one, one repository, that just, that just creates the magnitude of risk that is a little bit unnecessary. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's been wonderful to see. I mean, the Norwegians drove this because of their integrated project that they're developing. And it's enabled all of these industrial sources of CO2 across Northern Europe and Ireland to now have, an access, have access to a storage site. They don't have to worry about building a fairly modest scale capture plant on their cement plant or whatever, and do a storage site. They can ship the CO2 off to a large central storage site. Um, and it de-risks the projects in that sense as well. So I, I know they had seven MOUs signed with industrial sources, the Norwegians, and they might have even more by now. Um, but well, it's good, good to know, enable, uh, remove one of the barriers and help enable the whole uh, industry to... No, um, Richard, Roy here. I mean, well done to, I'm sure, I know you've been on this for years and I'm yeah. sure you had some influence on... Uh, I was involved. I was yeah. in the negotiations, <laughs> Richard. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. I was in the room, yes. Yeah, well done. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. There was, there was some who were less keen on it, but um, the technical issues can all be uh, addressed. But anyway, thank, thanks very much, Dahlia, for that, and uh, right. thanks, Richard, for that. Thank you for, thank you for that clarification. Thank you, because I, I made a note to look it up afterwards, but thank you for clarifying that. Do we have any um, questions for Dahlia? Do you want to take one more before we finish up? Does that sound... Yeah, I was going to say, I, I, need to, I need to log off fairly promptly, so if anyone yes. has any final questions... <laughs> Or if not, that's also fine. Okay. I think that sounds like a no further questions. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Dalia. It's been great to have you. Thanks, Dalia. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Dalia. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Dalia. That was great. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.